Jack steals it. And the Jack stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. It feels like a New England fairy tale. Pudge, the hard-nosed homeboy, takes his team to the World Series. And in the early minutes of an October morning, homers to win game six. Carlton Fisk, the name rings of strength. 24 years he crouched behind a major league plate. Eyes moving, gnarled fingers, flashing signals, mind choreographing the next sequence of pitches. Teammates admired him. Management respected him. And the fans of two cities loved him. He was so big, he was an uncomfortable sight to see, like a praying mantis folding up behind the plate. Carlton always had that little air about him, like that, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, this is what it's all about. I'm the boss. I'm running the show here. He was this very proud man, and he saw things one way. If you didn't agree with him, you know, fine with you, but he always thought he was in the right. There's a lot of people who at first didn't like him, didn't like his demeanor. He stood up erect, and it looked like as though he was uh, kind of arrogant. And I could remember the visiting team in the dugouts uh, yelling out at him. He didn't mean anything from it because, I mean, that's just the way he was. And he was a moody, irritable son of a, you know, he was real gritty. He had real contempt for young punks who are just looking out for themselves. Carlton Fisk is personified in my mind by a nap bat that Deion Sanders had. He was with the Yankees. Deion pops up and then kind of just stands there and then just starts jogging down the first base line. Fisk, you know, kind of biting his lip, wants to say something to him. So Deion steps in a second time he draws that little dollar sign in the dirt with his bat and fist keeps his mask on he's professional enough not to show him up by taking the mask off so the cameras can see what's going on but basically lights into dion right away and i just told him that i thought that there was a right way and a wrong way to play the game and he was playing it wrong because it offended guys like me and if he didn't care to play it right i just well, he'd go at it right here at home play he's back there yelling run the ball out like man you don't know me and i thought I had to uphold the, the integrity of the ghosts of Yankee Stadium past that have allowed him to wear a Yankee uniform. And he tried to make a big deal like he was some coach or some baseball god. Come on, man. Of course, Sanders, he said something about uh, slavery is dead, you know. Then Fisk got mad all over again. He said, you still don't get it, stupid. It's not about black and white. It's about pride. It was just one of those moments. It wasn't, it wasn't thought of. It was just... You know, a reaction on Pudge, like, what are you doing? This is not what you're supposed to be doing. You know, you're supposed to be running it out. You could see getting on your own teammate for not running. You, you wouldn't think you would want to inspire an opponent into doing a better job to beat you in the long run, but it offended Fisk's sense of propriety. I think it speaks a hell of a lot about who Carlton Fisk was. Not only a great catcher, but thought of himself as a protector of the game. Made sure that nobody else thought they were bigger than the game. I thought that when Carlton played in his era, he really epitomized the way the game should be played. Dedicated, hardworking, and refused to allow anybody to not play hard. Fisk's competitiveness may be a two-edged sword. In one way, it enables him to compete, to drive on, to battle, to win. In other cases, it causes him to battle too much and to be a, sort of a, a burr on the side of uh, not only competitors, but also teammates. He was a testy jerk. I mean, he came to beat you, and he was that way with his teammates and his, and his peers. He wasn't there to make friends. He was there to beat you. He played the game correctly, and he played it hard, and it didn't matter. If his best friend was out there at second base, he'd go try to get him. He played it with a 1930s, 40s sensibility of dirty uniforms, 
and in-your-face intensity that gave him an appeal to the fans that transcended his considerable gifts as an athlete. He represented a work ethic, a good, solid New England work ethic that the fans of New England could identify with. He had a newspaper delivery boy that would flip the newspaper and would sometimes bounce off the front door and roll down a couple of steps. In the middle of winter, Fisk was waiting for him at quarter of six in the morning and told him, if you can't bring that newspaper in the way you're supposed to and put it inside the door, don't ever come back again. Do your job right and you'll get a tip. Along with his drive was a kind of lack of understanding of the differences in other people. Everybody can't be like Carlton Fisk. In fact, I, I might argue that nobody is like Carlton Fisk. And if you've got two guys like him together, they'd probably hate each other. In a lot of ways, I'm stubborn. Um, I grew up in New England, knowing what an honest day's work for an honest day's pay is, and uh, you know, wanting the same in return, and the respect of that honest day's work. Filling out Fisk's authoritarian resume of pride and principle was an achingly slow, pitch-by-pitch -pitch approach to the game that tested the patience of everyone on the field. There were studies done that indicated that the average time of game when Fisk was catching was far greater than when anybody else was catching. We used to call him uh, the, you know, the human delay because he took his time. Carlton Fisk would slow games down on purpose to get control of the game. He was a concessionaire's uh, dream. <laughs> when he'd go to the mound. He'd stand there forever until the umpire came out to chase him off the mound. And of course, you're in the other dugout, you're just yelling at him, let's go. He could drive you crazy with his trips to the mound and that slow strut he had going back out there. And, but he knew what he was doing. And as a person, too, Pudge was very, very slow. He'd take a half hour to order breakfast. There's another hour to eat it. But that was his demeanor. It was tough to do an interview with him because it took him 20 minutes to get a sentence out and he would measure every word. And you know, he was tough to edit, a 15 second sound bite. He is amazingly slow paced and tenacious. But he's also got the personality of a dead carp in the Connecticut River. One of the things he knew how to do is uh, handle the pitching staff, in particular Bill Lee, who sometimes would lose his focus on the mound and Fist would go out there and they'd have a little talk. It was like a comedy routine. Bill Lee would be out there, get behind the plate. Fist would be throwing his arms up at him and they'd yell at each other. Usually it was to the back of Lee's head because as soon as Fist came out there, Lee would look, look out in center field. Fist would start on him and then start walking around and try to look at him straight in the face. Lee went, okay, okay, you know, with his glove, go back there, go go catch. And Lee would be okay, and he, you know, he'd pitch a good game. His job as a catcher was to develop the pitching staff, and he always believed that the catcher is part of the pitching staff. I would step into the batter's box, and he's one of the few guys that I felt like it was a battle between him and me. And you don't get too many catchers like that. Carlton knew how he wanted to throw to every hitter on the opposing ball club. The, everyday player and the role player coming off the bench and it was pretty much formatted accordingly and uh, you didn't deviate from the theme too much. I remember him telling me about how he would pitch me from year to year depending on how I made adjustments and how a certain pitcher either had success or didn't have success against me. More details than I would ever have imagined that a catcher would pay attention to. If he made a call and the guy hit out the ballpark or a double off the wall or whatever it might be and, and really had worked that hitter with his pitcher to put him in a position to get that out, and, and it didn't happen. He took it. He took it real hard on himself. Pitchers wouldn't go against him. They put their stuff in his hands. He was the boss. Born on December 26th, 1947, Fisk grew up with three brothers and two sisters in Charlestown, New Hampshire, a small town on the banks of the Connecticut River. Well, Fisk was the ultimate small town New England. There were four generations of his family that lived within one block. Every member of the Fisk family was expected to do two to four hours of work for the family every day. We raised our own animals, we had a milk cow, we raised our own beef, we had chickens in a large domestic garden, and my mom would 
canned vegetables for the whole family that would last all winter. When he was small and until three, four years, he was pretty pudgy. So we called him Pudge. His brothers are horses. They shoe Clydesdales with one hand. They can just throw bowls around. Calvin, the oldest, was quite a catcher also. Carlton was playing third, and Calvin was catching always. So I'm pitching batting practice, and the pop-up goes in the infield. I'm screaming, fist, 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 not even thinking. And there they come together, because Pudgy being a little tall, they got him right there. And looking around for the teeth and uh, blood all over the place. So we're playing the next day. That's the first time Carlton went behind the plate. His high school team played a maximum of 12 high school games a year. His baseball season up there in, in frozen New Hampshire began probably around the middle of April and ended by Memorial Day. Although he excelled behind the plate at Charlestown High School, Fisk's competitive skills were manifest on the basketball court, a result of endless hours of practice in his grandfather's barn. He played against a six foot ten guy from Concord named Craig Corson, who later played in the ACC. Fisk had 41 points and 36 rebounds as a 6 1 leaper. When he got home, his father told him, Well, you didn't make that foul shot. Yeah, if he didn't uh, play up to par, why his father would let him know. I was always criticizing, more or less, for him, and I always figured that whatever they're doing, they could do it a little better. If he accepted the word of his father, Carlton was less acquiescent among his peers. He punched a guy out one night. We were getting ready for a tournament, and it was a kid named Roger Conus. Called him by his middle name early. My dream was to be a 6'8 forward and play power forward for the Boston Celtics. Learned quickly enough that basketball was not going to be anything beyond college for sure. In 1965, Fisk accepted a basketball scholarship at the University of New Hampshire. I played baseball at the University of New Hampshire also, and we only played 12 or 14 games in. I spent more time in the gym than I did in, in class or studying, so I didn't go back. In 1967, Fisk signed with the Boston Red Sox, who had drafted him number four overall. After a year of military service, Fisk headed west to the minor league town of Waterloo, Iowa. He was groomed right from uh, day one as going to be a catcher in the major leagues for the Boston Red Sox. Despite the grooming, Fisk committed 22 errors in his first year. Over four seasons in the minors, he hit just 262. I watched him, ball would come in, boom, drop it. Hit his glove, drop it. Go, ball would go under his legs to the backstop. I was looking and said, this is the next Red Sox catcher. Get up to the plate, a curveball. This is spring training. Would not come close to it. He said, wow, I don't know about this kid. There was like a couple times there, he wondered whether he wanted to continue. I got some buddies from him. said, I'm about ready to quit coach. I said, no. You gotta suck that up, Bill. They promoted me to AAA ball to play in Louisville, Kentucky. I think mostly because the manager was Daryl Johnson, who was an ex-catcher, had some success in bringing some players along, and he talked to me and treated me like I was going to be a major league player. Fisk responded to Johnson's upbeat tutelage, and late in the 1971 season, the Red Sox deemed the 23-year-old ready for Fenway. He came up in September, and you would not believe it was the same player. It was like a 10-year Major League veteran, polished, catching the ball, doing everything he had to do, blocking balls. I was in shock. I said, how the heck did this kid improve that much? Hitting ball, waiting on the breaking ball, and he was ready. Empowered by a 293 batting average and a spot on the All-Star team in 1972, the rookie asserted himself as a team leader by publicly criticizing two of Boston's shining lights, Reggie Smith and Carl Yastrzemski. Yaz is supposed to be captain of the team. You know, Yaz isn't supposed to be, you know, going in the locker room smoking, you know, two packs of cigarettes and fooling around. 
So Fisk decides to say something publicly about it. I didn't like it uh, because Carlton Fisk didn't know us and he didn't know what was going on there. When I came up, rookies were seen and not heard. He was completely out of line because what leadership was he talking about? I wanted them to be the leaders on the team to lead guys like me who were rookies. You know, we were just, you know, bouncing off walls trying to find our way. And basically what I was saying was, hey, we've got 11 rookies on this team. We need some direction. I asked him, you know, who did he think he was? And what did he say? If you have something to say, you don't say it in the newspaper. You got a problem with me. You say it to my face. Unfortunately, Boston, local kid, someone says that to the newspaper, they eat it up. Fans liked it because here was a young kid taking over kind of a leadership type of thing with some of those statements. At that point, you started to have a divided clubhouse. And there was the Yas faction and then there was the other faction. Once that started, it was a downhill spiral anyway because it, it became a matter of uh, people trying to choose sides. It had a huge impact, not only on the Red Sox, but on Yaz as an individual. I think eventually Yaz came around to admire and respect Fisk, but that was a tension convention between the two of them for a while. Yeah, I don't think he regrets anything that he did or said, and uh, he could always back up what he said or what he did, always. Although his batting average slipped 47 points in 1973, Fisk maintained his power numbers. 26 homers and 71 RBIs. But in his third season as a regular, a collision at home nearly cost him his career. I drive into left center field, pull around the go. Here comes Lee. The runner was coming around third, and he was blocking the plate. Our little second baseman, uh, Mario Guerrero, held the ball too long and double clutched and threw it. He did not slide to the plate. He jumped and landed on the side of my leg and just destroyed my knee. And I saw his leg. You see how my knee is bent uh, when you're sitting down? Well, it was bent the other way. And I almost, <laughs> I tell you, regurgitated because it was one of the worst sights I've ever seen. The doctors that did my knee said this was the worst knee he'd ever done. They predicted I would never play again and probably have a limp and have chronic back problems throughout my life. Was out the rest of the year and then went back to New Hampshire in the off season and nobody heard anything about it. I just figured if I worked hard enough, there would be no problem, I'd make it back. He went through a program, he did a lot of hiking in the, in the snow, they built that knee and that leg up so much that it was like new. When Fisk went back to work behind the plate, he employed a new tactic meant to reduce the possibility of serious injury. Fisk at the time was just great at blocking the plate. I mean, he'd block that plate, keep you off it. And he came right out and said it, I'll never block the plate again. And he didn't, but he developed that sweep tag that everybody uses. So what he did was he went out and got the ball. He gave the runner part of the plate, but he you know, tried to tag him before he uh, hit the plate. And what's wrong with that? But injury plagued Fisk again in 1975, when he broke his arm in spring training. After missing half the season, Fisk went on a hitting binge that helped carry the Red Sox into one of the most exciting World Series ever played. I don't think anybody gave us a chance, uh, I, I, but uh, you know, that series was such a great series because you had so many stars from each team uh, competing against each other. We did have the edge because the Reds thought that uh, they were going to walk away within four games it was going to be all over. There was a possibility of a, a five-game series. I mean, that was the confidence I think the Reds had in themselves. After each gained a victory at Fenway, Boston and Cincinnati were deadlocked at five in the 10th inning of game three at Riverfront, when Fisk became entangled with Ed Armbrister. Batter's interference wasn't called. Fisk, I got his glove on Armbrister's um, bat and caused a great dispute around uh, home plate. To this day, I believe that Larry Barnett was right, that it wasn't interference, that, that Barnett made the right call. Fisk's throwing error set up the Reds' winning run. After splitting the next two games, the Red Sox returned to Fenway, down 3-2. to two. 
that 1975 Game 6 of the World Series was operatic and preposterous. Well hit right field, that ball. If it's fair, she's gone. It is a fair ball. Home run for Geronimo. It was a great game. A um, lot of great plays, uh, just a lot of heroes, I thought, in the, in the entire series on both sides. Losing 6-3 in the eighth, Boston manager Daryl Johnson fingered former Red Bernie Carbo to pinch hit. He was completely fooled by the pitch and just went like that and just barely fouled it off. It was an awful swing. With two on, two out, and a 2-2 count, Carbo set himself. We were just sitting around waiting to lose that game. And then we went from you know, total, uh, you know, to being like, OK, we're in this. Carbo's three-run homer tied the game. Then, in the ninth, the Red Sox loaded the bases with nobody out. Red Lynn hit a ball down the left field corner. Denny Doyle was the third. Don Zimmer was the third base coach. And Zimmer said, no, no. Doyle thought he said, go, go. With the game still tied, Fisk hunkered behind the plate and awaited the leadoff man in the top of the 11th. It looked like we were going to win, and it looked like they were going to win, and then it's tied up, and so it's almost like nobody knew what to say. It's midnight, it's cold and damp, everybody's tired, and Pete comes up, he's not tired. I went up to home plate, and I looked back at Carlton Fisk, and I said, man, is, is this fun, Carlton, or what, playing this game? He's jabbering about, it. man, this is the greatest game I've ever played, and don't you think, hey, Fisky, what do you think? This is the greatest game, and this is what baseball's all about. Did it hit him? It hit him! It hit him! Hit by a pitch, Rose stood on first base. With Ken Griffey bunting, Fisk made the first of two clutch defensive plays that inning. Up next, Joe Morgan. There's a long shot to deep right back to Evans, back, back, and what a grab! Evans made a grab and saved the home run on that one. Throws the first for a double play. Leading off the bottom of the 12th, Fisk visited with the man scheduled to hit behind him. I'm on the end deck circle with Fred, and I said, Freddie, I can feel something good here. I'm going to hit a ball off the wall to drive me in. Game tied, 6-6. Six, six. Darcy pitching. Fisk takes high and inside. Ball one. When Fisk came up, I threw one pitch. It was a ball. And I thought, OK, I'm really going to throw this one hard. The 1-0 delivery to Fisk. He swings long drive, left field. I was on the bench, and when he hit it, I knew it was out of the ballpark. It was just a question of whether it was going to be foul or fair. If it stays fair, it's gone. I thought it was going to be foul. The wind was kind of blowing from left to right, and it kind of hung up there in the air. If they took a picture of the audience instead of Carlton Fisk, you'd, you'd see everybody's head pointing towards the left field screen in Fenway Park. From where we were, we couldn't see whether it was a fair or foul. And so you sort of look in the home plate to see what he was doing. As it's going out, everybody is holding their breath except Carlton Fisk, who knows that what you do under these circumstances it help it along a little bit. Give it some English, twist it around. And the ball listened to him, and it nestled up there against the foul pole for a home run. Home run! <laughs> If he'd have jumped one more time running down to first base, I'd have gone out and kicked him. And then when I round at third base, there's somebody that came out of the stands and was going to pat me on the back or shake hands. And for the split second, I was saying, what is this person doing out here, jumping in on our time? I tried to give him my shoulder, but I think I, I missed him. That home run went from Kennebunkport to Burlington, down to Hartford, to Newport, up through Cape Cod, rattled around Worcester County, came down the Mass Pike, and erupted in just one huge explosion. Nobody left. Everybody stayed at Fenway for like a half an hour, singing, hugging people they'd never met before. Nobody wanted to leave. Television did a great job of capturing Carlton Fisk's emotion and him throwing the ball back, trying to keep it fair. Harry Coyle, the great NBC TV director, 
had put a camera and a cameraman out there in the scoreboard and left. And the picture should have been taking the ball, coming toward it for the homer. At the time Fisk came to bat, one of the famous Fenway Park rats started crawling up towards the cameraman, and he's not going to budge an inch. He's not going to swing that camera around to left field to follow the ball, because then he's going to have a rat on his lap. So he keeps the camera trained on Fisk. And by pure chance, they got the picture of him waving the ball to stay fair. And that was one of the great video shots of all time. In the business, we call that the signature moment. Anyone who saw that game or anyone who ever saw film clips of that game will forever remember. You say the name Pudge Fisk, and you're going to think of a guy standing there going, trying to wave the ball to stay inside the foul pole. To see Carlton there jumping up and down and trying to help it to stay fair, uh, I think it was a great moment in the game of baseball, without a doubt. Carlton Fisk, home run will go down in history. Unfortunately, <laughs> Cincinnati won the World Series. In the mid-70s, the Yankee Red Sox rivalry really kicked in. We would go from our hotel to Fenway Park with security people on our bus. New York, I think, uh, was much worse to go in for the Red Sox than Fenway was for the Yankees. My God, what a, what a rivalry that is. I mean, uh, uh, you would go into Fenway Park and, you know, uh, people would spit on you and, and throw beer in your face. When I got traded from the Angels, and the first time the Yankees came into Fenway Park, I had a couple of ex-teammates that were traded to the Yankees, Ed Figueroa Pitch and Mickey Rivers. And so Mickey came over to me to say hello. And after he left, Fisk called me over. And he said, uh, we don't talk to the Yankees here. He was the epitome of a kid. A local kid grows up, becomes catcher for the Red Sox. And he hated the Yankees, which is what they love here. And he made no mistake about that. Mickey Rivers, Mr. Gattis, trying to hit everybody with a sucker punch. Fisk's counterpart in pinstripes matched his competitive fire. Munson and Fisk were the two best catchers in the American League, and they were they they would never even talk to one another. Thurman was such a little grumpy guy. He come up to the plate, hey Thurman, what do you want? You know, hey Pudge, how you doing? I'm pretty good. How you doing? You know that type of thing. It just became an obsession. Fisk didn't like Munson. Munson hated Fisk. It was a little like, you know, blue collar versus white collar, or a little like lunch pail versus dining out. Munson was a hard-nosed, mean, ornery sucker, and Carlton actually read books. Fisk is a tall, good-looking, elegant guy, an elegant-looking catcher. Munson, short, Yogi Berish, built like, you know, a refrigerator. The players called him squatty body, tugboat because he was kind of round and stocky, a very fine catcher, a very fine hitter, but not equal to Carlton Fisk. But just more polished as a player. You know, Thurman would eat dirt. You know, he was tough as nails. The whole Fisk-Munson feud started when, in 1971, in September, when he was called up, Munson hit a ground ball wide of first. Stremski got it through the second half show. Munson had stumbled coming out of the batter's box. Fisk beat him down the line, and if Aparicio's throw had been in time, it would have been a 3-6-2 double play with Fisk, the good-looking guy, showing up Munson, the not-so-good-looking guy. That started it. Munson hated him forever. They had two or three fights, the Red Sox and the Yankees, in 1972. Fisk was in the middle of all of them. But the greatest one was August 1st of 73. Gene Michael missed a squeeze by and it's Thurman Munson coming down the line. He dove, cleats up into Fisk. They end up rolling around, pounding each other. Fisk fight took about a half an hour to break up. They'd love to have a collision. They'd be the two guys right there to run one run over the other ones and then just battle it out right there. The press notes at Yankee Stadium one day, Munson read that Fisk was first in the American League in assists by two over Thurman Munson. And what Munson did that night was he dropped every third strike he could so that he could pass Fisk in the AL assist contest. I think that they could sit down and, and go in a room and talk. I think they'd come out with arms around each other, best buddies. Their rivalry ended tragically in 1979. We were in Milwaukee, and I had taken a cab to the ballpark early. And there's always, uh, you know, a lot of people outside at County Stadium. I was right behind Pudge, and uh, a young fellow came up to him and said something to him. Some guy 
wants an autograph, but in the process of the autograph, saying, did you hear about Thurman? I said, you know, I went, oh, yeah, what is what happened? He says, he died in a plane crash. And I said, you're kidding me. And his face turned white. He just, he just really looked shocked. I get inside, and the radio's on, and he died in a plane crash. That was one of the lowest moments of my career. He was your contemporary, played the same position, and you were linked with him. When that happens, it's got to affect you personally. And it's almost like, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. In 1976, Fisk and Fred Lynn and Rick Burleson signed unique contracts. In each one of those contracts, there was a two-paragraph clause which gave the Red Sox the right of first refusal when the contracts expired in 1980. And there was a question of whether the Red Sox had to tender an offer by December 20th, and it's their own in-house lawyers, and people said, no, you don't have to do that. Uh, another source told me that um, it was deliberately mailed after the postmark deadline because they wanted to get rid of him, but if they traded him, it would be a very unpopular decision. Well, it was too late. They had to do it one day late, and the arbitrator eventually found that it was a violation of the collective bargaining agreement, and he made Fisk a total free agent. We didn't understand it. Why, why would this, you know, here's one of the best catchers in the game. Why would you not tender him a contract? They made him feel like... <laughs> We can do it whatever we want, and it doesn't make any difference because you'll stay anyways. Never one to stay where he wasn't welcome, Fisk at 33 signed with the White Sox, creating a void behind the plate at Fenway and feeling a loss in his heart. The reason I left was not of my choice. The reason I left was because of Haywood Sullivan and Buddy LaRue, who were then, quote, unquote, the owners of that organization. There was no question that there was a bitterness between acting Red Sox owner Haywood Sullivan and Fisk. They did not like each other. Haywood was not going to bring Fisk back. And I believe he did it intentionally because his son was coming up and was a pretty good catcher in AAA. Now Fisk, he walks, makes him look like a bad guy. He was pretty down and, and pretty disgusted with them with the Red Sox. I couldn't understand it. This is what I wanted to be. This is where I wanted to play since I was this high. I wanted to play in Boston. I wanted to wear a Red Sox uniform. I wanted to play in Fenway Park. There was a, a sentiment attached to Carlton Fisk and why they ever got rid of him, I think, was a big mistake. It crushed me. It really did. And I think back on it, and it affected my play for a long time. Reversing his Boston number to read 72, Fisk wasted no time demonstrating his value to the White Sox and his indignation for his former boss. Hey, hey, go! Get on back! Please hey, let me! Hey, holy cow! He came back with the White Sox opening day, hit a three-run homer in the eighth inning to win the game off of Bob Stanton. Talk about getting even. I was at the game in center field and the bleachers. But then I went home, and on television, when he was being interviewed, he was wearing a Haywood Sucks t-shirt, which I just, for the rest of my life, will love him for. Though he made the All-Star team in his first two seasons with Chicago, Fisk struggled. Then, in 1983, his 26 homers and 86 RBIs helped drive the White Sox to their first postseason in 24 years. We first got him, uh, he was probably the number one idol here with the White Sox. I think with the players, there was a lot of respect. In 1985, Fisk was even better. At 37, he produced a 10th All-Star season, 37 homers and 107 RBIs. By next spring, he found himself at odds once again with management. I was not a happy camper. I was an angry player for a lot of reasons. Buddy LaRue and Haywood Sullivan were the beginning of it, and it carried on through the White Sox organization. He was very moody and grumpy, and he ripped management in the paper, and Ken Harrelson became the general manager, and he puts Fisk in left field. He would fight it, and he would, he would turn, his, turn on it, and it would just look awful, but he would always catch the ball. That was such a slap in the face and such a, an insult to the commitment that I made to be the catcher that I was. They wanted him to become a left fielder and make room for Joel Skinner, just a kid. This went on and on, and he always seemed to wind up back at his old job. Going from an all-star catcher hitting 37 home runs to being so far removed from that part of the game in left field that I don't know if I ever really covered from that. 
I guess they just misjudged Fisk and they just thought maybe he would do it and I think that started a lot of the resentment with him and the organization and then it just festered over the years. I always told him, Carl, the odds are we're going to have a misunderstanding somewhere along the way. But Fisk reserved his choice remarks for Einhorn's partner. When someone says something in any way reflects badly on Jerry Reinsdorf, he takes it very personal and shuts them off. And that's what happened here. It got personal. Reinsdorf thought he was an a I think it just came from the fact that he wouldn't kiss anyone's butt. He just said what he wanted to. They thought he was kind of poisoning the minds of the young pitching staff. He's making people play correctly. He's taking a young team and leading him to be a pennant contender, yet was so underappreciated, it was unbelievable. The end of his career, he was kind of the, the father to some of these kids. He gave them direction, and sometimes the direction wasn't in the, in the best interest of the, of the club. It was more for Carlton Fisk. Despite the tensions with management and the lack of further postseason play, Fisk continued to produce. In 1991, the 43 year old made his 11th All Star team and finished with 18 homers and 74 RBIs. I played with guys on my team that were younger than my kids. So the strength and conditioning part of my game, without that discipline, I don't think I would have played as long as I did. One night, I came back to my office. It must have been midnight. The game had long been over. And I see a light down the hall from my office, which we had converted into a weight training room. And I go in there, and there's Carlton Fisk and Steve Carlton still working out at midnight. There's a certain defiance about Carlton Fisk. Defying age and defying all the things that tear down your body was part of what made him last a long time and what made him great. But age finally claimed Fisk in 1992. Playing in just 62 games, he hit 229 and three homers. Although he set the record for most career games as a catcher in 93, it was clear he had limped into history. His stubbornness played in at the end that it didn't seem like he would ever acknowledge that he was getting older. He was still physically fit, but it was obvious in the last year of his career that his skills had eroded. It felt like everybody was trying to put him in a closet and close the door and go away. You know, I don't care how difficult a guy is. Here's a Hall of Famer and treat him with some respect. And Carlton Fisk Day at Comiskey Park was kind of a kiss off. Jerry Reinsdorf wasn't there. And yeah, he got his motorcycle and his picture and everything else, but there was an obvious real rift between Pudge and the organization. I was a little naive to it, thinking that maybe I was going to be able to continue to contribute. And as it turned out, it was you know, basically set up to be the last day that I ever played. It hurt a lot of people to see, you know, see your friend treated incorrectly and treated poorly. It hurts. They went through that whole business of taking him on this road trip to Cleveland, and then they release him there. It was just a press release. <laughs> what? You know, and everybody knew the end was near and that it was going to be over, but uh, to release him when they were out of town, man, that was low. That was an absolute slap in the face. Make no mistake about it, it might have been Ron Schuler who announced it, but it was certainly Jerry Reinsdorf who, who made the decision. He took it extremely hard. I think the players knew, my scouts, the front office, the coaches and manager, I think they knew. He was the last one to know. He came to the ballpark in the stands. He wouldn't come in the clubhouse, and he was shaking hands with his teammates, saying goodbye from the uh, left field corner, which was a very strange scene to see. After 24 years, it was over. In October, Fisk showed up unannounced to Comiskey Park. For the first game of the playoffs against Toronto, just happened to be hanging around there, and here comes Fisk. You know, he'd gotten into the building. He wanted to say hello to the guys. He tried to come down just to wish us well in 93 playoffs after being released, and they would not let him in the clubhouse. The Sox have maintained that it was Major League Baseball security that kept him out of the locker room. But either way, you have to accommodate something like that. In the end, maybe he loved the game and more than the game loved him. Fisk fought baseball, ate baseball, slept baseball. I remember a game at Yankee Stadium. It was the second game of a doubleheader. He's still running down the first, you know, when nobody's on, backing up a potential overthrow. And I yell out, hey, 
Pudge or, or Carlton. You're gonna be tired if you keep this up. And he's just trotting by and he hears him, you ain't kidding. And he's trotting back to the plate. There's an old saying, he was good for so long he became great. Well, the measure of greatness is the induction in the Hall of Fame. On July 23rd, 2000, when Carlton Fisk was inducted into the Hall of Fame as the all-time leader in home runs as a catcher, he chose to be remembered as a member of the Red Sox. I always felt that my duty and responsibility on the field was to my pitchers. I know offense is an important part of the game, but I would do whatever it took to instill the confidence in my pitching staff and ensure the feeling that somehow we, not you, not me, but we, to get through any situation. I grew up in New England. My dream was to play for the Red Sox, and I did. So that part of the dream came true. Then to hit the home run in the 75 World Series and have it be so memorable and have me be connected with that moment, that's the reason that I chose the Red Sox. In September 2000, the last bit of old snow melted between Fisk and the Red Sox when his number 27 was retired. The man of the hour, Carlton Fisk. Carlton Fisk epitomized what New England is all about. You know, the harsh winters, the run of the sap from the maple trees, slow and predictable every year. I mean, he's backwoods American values. This is truly an honor, truly an award be part of this organization to be back home is especially thrilling especially satisfying i thank you for allowing me to come back home he ended up playing more games with the white sox uniform on than he did with a red sox uniform on except if you go out around the country and ask any baseball fan about carlton fisk the image who he is where he played is 27 arms in the air on an October night in 1975 as a member of the Boston Red Sox. As a teenager, Fisk played an American Legion game at Doubleday Field in Cooperstown, New York. More than three decades later, he came full circle as he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Between those events stretches one of the best catching careers in baseball history, crowned by 2,226 games behind the plate. Carlton Fisk would never take no for an answer, not even from himself. For ESPN Classic Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.